the world's been flooded with liquidity post-COVID, and there's just so many dollars running around. Um, it caused bubbles in a number of areas, real estate, tech, and something like gold was forgotten about. It, it, w it was deemed no longer relevant in an investment portfolio. And the sector had performed pretty badly. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host of this channel. And today I'm in New York, but I'm at the SME Current Trends in Mind Finance Conference, and I have Rob McCune with me, chief owner over at uh, McCune Mining. You haven't changed your title yet, have you? I have not. Have not. <laughs> okay, fantastic. No, Rob, really appreciate you joining us. We usually do those virtually, those interviews. And That's I really true. appreciate it. Now we're in you person know, doing in per it. Oh, it's so much better. So much better. And we have lots to talk about. We just, you know, just chatted 20 minutes pretty much about what we're going to talk about. Let's see if we can get that all into a 20 minute conversation here. But uh, let, let's start with the macro, Rob. Um, gold and copper in particular have moved tremendously in recent weeks. Let's talk about the moves and uh, maybe the motivation behind those price moves for a second. And the other question is part B, maybe how vindicated and uh, how, how would you feel like, how proud are you of your gold calls? Like, I remember us chatting and you've given other interviews about $3,000 gold. And pardon, pardon it, but the commentary was net positive sometimes on, on Twitter. It was like, oh, Rob's lost it, 3,000, never. Now Citibank's made it a price target. How do you feel about that? Yes, exactly. How do you feel about that? I thought it's unfolding exactly the way I thought it would, that the price of gold's going higher. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said that price. <laughs> it must feel good, though. Like, you must be walking through the offices with a big, big smile on your face, I, I would assume. Sure. Higher yeah. prices make you smile. <laughs> Um, and it improves our uh, top line and our bottom line. So uh, it gives more opportunity. I just, I guess I haven't done enough buying in the market before it's come up. I mean, I, I thought there was a real sweet spot in the market and I was buying interest in a number of explorers. Um, but I should have done more. I don't think you've missed your opportunity yet, personally. I think we're just at the start for the, for the explorers. The producers are already... Yes. Appreciate it a little bit. I think we're still far from a you know exuberant environment, but uh, true. I mean, they've moved, but they were much. They were a lot cheaper mm -hmm. uh, six months ago. We'll talk after this interview. Um, but Rob, let's, let's discuss the the reasons for the move in gold. Like what would, you know, you make your predictions of three thousand dollars, but uh, like what do those predictions sort of have come true? You mentioned debt just now, but uh, what other scenarios are playing well, out? Well, I mean, I mean there's, gold the world's been flooded with liquidity post-COVID, and there's just so many dollars running around. Um, it caused bubbles in a number of areas, real estate, tech, and something like gold was forgotten about. It, it, w it was deemed no longer relevant in an investment portfolio. And the sector had performed pretty badly. So it was discarded, but in, for gold to move, you've been seeing a couple of things happening. One, the geopolitical conflicts that take, are taking place are concerning people and, and some are going back to the traditional. You have the sanctions that Washington and Europe have put on Russia and then looking at China, and it's forced some of those countries, the BRIC countries in particular, to create their own financial transfer system. and. And then they're saying, well, we don't want the dollar. We want to settle in our own currencies, whereas the dollar used to be the reserve currency of the world, you, and you had to settle your oil purchases. You had to buy dollars to, to buy oil from anybody, but no longer. So, and these central banks are starting to say, well, I have dollars in reserve. I, maybe I don't need them, or maybe I don't want them because the U.S. is being a spendthrift right now. It's out there just debasing its currency, so I'm going to get out of dollars because it's no longer, I don't need them as much to buy my energy or other raw materials. And I'm not confident that they're going to be a responsible party with their currency. So you've had the last two years, you've seen central banks buying greater than we've seen in 20 or 30 years. So that there's that shift and that's been driving gold and then, I guess China, you can even buy gold at Costco now. And they, it sold, sells out every time they 
bring in a new supply of gold. The question is like, was accessibility to gold and gold bullion maybe a problem in the past? Is it, is it super easy now? Costco, you just, uh, mm. you know, buy, buy your $6 chicken, whatever it is, and then, right. you, you know, buy a bar of bullion. It's probably a golden chicken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, that, that would be another part, that it, it, yeah. you wouldn't have to go to a bank to buy it, or you wouldn't have to go to a, find a coin dealer that might sell it. Because I find it quite fascinating because all of a sudden the demand is massively increased. Yes, we're seeing all the macroeconomic factors weighing on it, but maybe ease of accessibility just really helped. Yes. So, as you said. No, I, I would think that's it. And for copper, the disruption of the supply chains has done it. Um, they're just roots, supply sources for political reasons, conflict are no longer as secure and every, like car manufacturers, Stellantis came in and bought into our copper deposit and that was the first time a car company bought into a copper deposit anywhere in the world. And then we had a discussion with Volkswagen and they, they surprised me. They had 16 geologists on staff. 16. And that was the story. And I went, you know, these, these companies are looking. I mean, they're looking at the EV movement and the batteries and what goes into the batteries and maybe looking at their, where they source the material to build their car bodies or their electrical systems. And all of a sudden, they're going, yeah, we've got to find new source of supply. Car manufacturers, I said that on the panel the other day, were the first ones to move. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Like, why were car manufacturers the first one to figure out, okay, we have to invest, we have to secure our supply chain here? One is to control cost. And I mean, they're, they're selling a consumer product and it, a lot of it's based on price. And they're pushed towards electric vehicles. They're going into a vehicle that costs maybe 50% more than an internal combustion car. So they're very conscious of that cost. And they view it as a competitive advantage if they can get, get offtake agreements from companies that are producing the metals. Well, that's a very current topic right now. That's the U.S. tariff discussion on, on Chinese EVs because they're so much cheaper. Yes. That is one big part of that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, talking copper, BHP and Engel uh, seems to be an interesting dance that is happening and uh, everybody seems to be reporting on it. It's a $40 billion transaction or supposed transaction. Engel just rejected a third bid, but they kept the deadline open and put, extended it. Said, we're, we're probably available or we can buy us. At the right price. At the right like, price. Th my, my question is, like, what, what kind of signal is this transaction or deal sending to the copper market? Uh, well, the ownership of copper deposits is shrinking. And maybe it's hard to find new copper deposits and bring them on stream in time to satisfy the needs for the energy transition. But <coughs> maybe just, but it doesn't it change anything. It just changes hands. It change, the, the projects change owner, but they're not new mines coming on they straight. want well yeah say in right. bhp wants to be a big player in the new energy area right. where copper is the but new it doesn't, oil it doesn't change the fundamentals no but that it's an admission that they don't want to go through the permitting the exploration may not be delivering the deposits fast enough so you want to be big in the game you want to buy someone who's already there yeah. and and anglo wasn't performing very well in the market so yeah, good point, because they sold their coal assets and became vulnerable. Yes, so, yes. No, it makes sense. Um, interesting, you know, maybe follow-up to that, like timing is, is a really interesting matter, because you, you know it as well as anybody, permitting your mine, bringing it into production is, you don't do that overnight. It's a 10, 15, even 20-year process sometimes. You were recently in Argentina. Yes. You met with uh, President Javier Millet, so I'm curious, like, can he be of any help and, like, the, you know, the government in Argentina help maybe cut some red tape and bring that down maybe to... I don't know, ut utopian five years or 10 years? Um, before Malay got elected, I was a fan of his. He, guy comes out, he's campaigning, he has a chainsaw in his hand, he says, look, I'm going to cut the bureaucracy. I'm going to make it easy for foreign investment. We sat down, we had an hour-long conversation, probably for the first 20 minutes. He talked about what he wants to achieve, and, and that's all about attracting foreign capital. Um, in all industries, but he recognizes that mining has a special spot in terms of building exports, creating not only jobs for the mine, <coughs> but secondary and tertiary industries that grow out of a mine being established. So he said, okay, well, we got to get rid of the foreign exchange controls. 
so that if you come in here and invest, you can take money out, your profits out. Uh, we're going to reduce the tax rate um, quite considerably. We're going to put a stability agreement in place. And then there was a host of other changes that would make it easier for foreign capital to feel comfortable in the country. Um, his, what he's asking to do has passed the lower house of the government, and now it has to go through the upper. One caution is that he's a political outsider, so that he um, doesn't have the groundswell of support that others would, but it's, he's an economist by training, he's worked in business, he's articulate, um, and very logical in his approach. Now, he appealed to me because he's a libertarian by nature, and I'm... I think he I'm, used the word anarcho-capitalist yes. at one point, I believe, right? And I'm, uh, I'm of that same thought process. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, it'd be very exciting at the Canadian, at the PDAC, the Prospectors and Developers Convention in March in Toronto, I sensed there was a delegation from Argentina, but you could sense the interest in amongst the majors and even the intermediates and juniors going, if this goes through, we should be in Argentina. And, and it's like they were standing on one side of a fence and looking over it at Argentina that hasn't been developed like Chile or Peru. And the province we're in, San Juan province, and I guess there's one or two others that are about it, but if those mines that it, or those deposits that have been outlined there were to come into production in the next 10 years, Argentina would close to its output of copper would start be rivaling Peru's, which is about 13% of the world's production, annual production. So you, you have Chile at 27%, Peru at 13%. So 40% of the world's annual production comes out of those two countries. And right next door is Argentina. It'd be over 50% of the world's production coming out of there. So that's a place where the majors want to be because it hasn't been developed yet. I forgot whose presentation I was listening to the other day, but they said if our project was about 20 kilometers to the, to the west in Chile, it would have been developed 20 years ago. Yeah. All right. So, so this is land of undeveloped uh, resources. Yeah. And I said to him that... Argentina is like the story of Sleeping Beauty. It's sort of, you had the populist governments that put Sleeping Beauty asleep, Argentina asleep, and you're coming along and you're the prince that kisses her and wakes her up. He must have liked that. <laughs> he liked the idea he was a prince. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fantastic. But uh, what, what would be the development timeline? I'm curious, like, also, how does the higher copper price sort of factor into your development plans now with McEwen and Copper? Well, it's a dollar higher than we did then. PEA. So the first five years, we're going to be have annual production, projected to have annual production of 400 million pounds of copper. That's, a, that's another $400 million. Um, the, we've done some preliminary estimates if all the changes went through that he's talking about. It would add a billion dollars to our NPV, which is already 2.9 billion. So you're, you're about a $4 billion NPV. And IRR? Because that's the metric I personally look at. Uh, well, the IRR at 375 was 21% okay. after tax. So hmm. <laughs> L Lower tax, you automatically IRR. Oh, and, and then the higher price, of course. Yeah. I, I, I haven't done that number, but I'll do it for you, Kai. That'd be interesting. Like, cause, like we talked about reserve pricing before yes. in the record, but maybe that's a, a good segue to talk about it as well. Um, call, uh, assumptions, reserve price assumptions, not just for copper, but gold as well. Because yes. um, I posted on Twitter recently that Barrick, I think, is sitting at 1350 Newman, I think, 1450 I might be off by $10. But what would that do if they were to raise their reserve pricing to 1600 $1,700 U as well at McEwen Mining? Right. And what, lower what, the cutoff grade. And lower the cutoff grade, like moving those prices around. Because everybody's screaming, well, you gotta, you have to replace your ounces in the ground. But if you just you know, move the needle a little bit and just adjust the little things in an Excel sheet, you can or you're gonna get away with no m yes. maybe. Yes. Yes. That, that's very true. So. Uh, forget that, Dan. Well, our, our projected cost, cash cost is $1.07 a pound. Mm. And uh, all in sustaining will be $1.64 a pound. Mm. 
and at gold at 470, 480, um, you're talking a big margin. You're talking profit margins sitting, gross profit margins sitting at above 70 percent. Um, so, I, well, I like before dealing with expanding the resources. I like taking a copper or any non-gold project because I've been associated with gold for a long time and turn it into a gold equivalent. So if you were to take the price of gold today and divide it by the price of copper, you come up with the number of pounds of copper needed to equal one ounce of gold. So uh, when you do that calculation, our three 37.6 billion pounds of copper in resources would be equivalent to more than a 70 million ounce gold deposit. And the, over the average, or over the 27 year life of the mine, we'd be averaging 321 million pounds of copper a year. <clears throat> that would be better than a 600,000 ounce gold equivalent. And at a dollar seven, your cash costs are coming in under $600 an ounce, and your all in sustaining costs are coming in at just over $800 an ounce. So, in my book, that's a really good gold deposit because you've got 27 years. But 70 million ounces, to give another perspective, is as much as the Timmins Gold District has produced in the last 100 years. And that's one of the most prolific gold districts in Canada. So, so that's, a, that's a big number. Um, I do not know what happens if we suddenly change the price, what happens, how much our resources might grow. But you bring up a really valid point that maybe this, some of the rush to do M&A is premature because they haven't done the calculation that they've got a longer life as a result of the higher price of gold and the lower cutoff. Because yeah. the banks are predicting $2,000 as a new floor for, for gold as well. So if you were to Good throw that, them. right? If they were to throw that into the calculations, curious what that does to the metrics, right? Um, you <laughs> presented yesterday, you gave a keynote here at the SME conference talking about how to make mining relevant again. You, you gave 10 points mm -hmm. as part of that. What were the three, like, what, if you were to pick three of those 10 points, what would you choose? And uh, how do we make mining relevant again, Rob? I think a lot of people do not understand the connection between mining and their, their lifestyle. So it's really trying to show the vast array of products that are made from what we take out of the ground. And if we were to remove those from our life, we would slide backwards considerably. You might even envision a cataclysmic collapse of modern civilization. And most people, when they're looking at, well, mining's bad, they are making a tacit assumption that their life isn't going to change. Mining's going to stop and there'll be different sources of energy. Not recognizing that most of the technology or the equipment being built to combat climate change is built with what came out of the ground, what comes out of the ground. So you have that. And I, I titled my talk, you know, um, Become a Nudist. Stop mining. <laughs> but it's just um, because your clothes are going to come off. I was going to say that works for four months of the year, but then you might have to rethink that. That's right. <laughs> I mean, in Germany or Canada, I mean. Maybe three months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that, that was one point of just we need to spend time getting people to appreciate the contribution that the industry makes to modern civilization. And then we have to show the world that we're not as bad as they perceive us to be. And giving clear, vivid illustrations of not only the reclamation that we've done, but our current practices in putting a lot of money in to protect the environment. Um, and then we need to somehow amplify and broaden the exposure of that messaging of those two points by using the tools that the opposition to mining utilized, the media, and just saying, well, we have to get more people talking about mining in a positive way. And so we have a bunch of um, suppliers to the mining industry 
suppliers of service and products, but and say, you have, we want you <laughs> to ensure that we're around longer so you still have business from us. But in order to do that, we want you to go out and spend time and money talking to your clients about the benefits and need for mining. And it's really taking a model from what we see is, is in the grocery industry, where if you want your product on a shelf, you pay the grocer a listing fee. And that's really the concept here. I have spoken to one of our, well, to the audit firm we use. Um, I did a presentation a couple of weeks ago at another spot, and he was, the, our audit partner was in the audience, and he went, oh. And then we had an audit committee meeting a week or two ago, and he said, well, I've been thinking about what you said, and I've already talked to some people about it. Um, and so we're going to try to do that. But we need more people doing that. And, and like here we are in a law office, and they've made space available for the industry. We just, and we have the industry gathered here, but we have to go beyond our industry, well beyond our industry talking about mining and the positive elements of it. When you talked about it, like tracing sort of back to the roots, it reminded me of tracking bananas. Like where are the bananas coming from that you're buying in the grocery store? Yeah. Right? Just you know, get a QR code for the copper in your in your phone yeah. or something. You know, just print it out in part of the manual or the virtual manuals. Like, okay, your copper is coming from McEwen Copper in Argentina. Yes. Right. Yes. Or, I mean, when you go to the supermarket and you buy a banana and then you go buy some meat and it's wrapped up in plastic and... But the cow isn't there that was just butchered that you, where the steak came from. You're not making that association. And your car, you're not making an association with a mine or a rubber plantation somewhere else in the world. It's not as transparent yet. I think we've and we have, to, we have to be more transparent. Yeah. I think that's the word that I'd really like to stress, the industry. Like, I, I was a bit almost disappointed because you didn't say one thing. I thought you might go there because like, you're a philanthropist as well. Yeah. Right. I think also talking about our achievements and talking what the mining industry does. And uh, I don't want to put you on the spot here because you would have mentioned it, I'm sure, if you wanted to yesterday. But Oh, the you, mining you industry, like, like, it's contributed like, a lot. Maybe I'll give you a personal example. I have my, my, my son broke his femur in Vancouver yes. about four years ago or so and uh, took him to BC Children's Hospital. And they have a donor wall. Like, and the biggest donors were tech, uh, wheat and precious metals, I believe. And that actually made me proud. It was just, like the industry I'm involved yes. in were big donors. Right. Well, so you, you can go to, a, yes, you can go to Toronto and go up University Avenue, and you'll see all sorts of names. Uh, Peter Monk wing at the hospital. I think your name is on a hospital wing as well. Like talking about that more, I think yeah. that might make a difference as well. Or maybe just some feedback, because I expected you yesterday as part of your talk. Talk about that. Well, it's, it, a, it's a really it, well, positive it, it, impact because yes, I was impacted personally, and I thought I was proud of that when I saw that. Yeah, well, my wife and I have been able to address areas that we think would benefit society. We have uh, established in 2003, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, a stem cell research center, regenerative medicine, and the largest research hospital in Canada. Um, and they're doing fab fabulous work. Bayer Pharmaceuticals come in supporting some of our work with the heart. Um, we're putting stem cells, um, cultivating uh, a population of about a billion stem cells, and someone who's had a heart attack pumping it into the scar tissue, and which makes the heart less efficient. And they're regrowing muscle tissue there. Um, human trials are starting in about a year. They've done large animal models. And this could do away with heart transplants, artificial hearts. Um, and heart attacks are one of the biggest, behind cancer is the second largest disease uh, our population is facing. But that's where mining is making a change. That mining right. there, yeah. Or indirectly. And there's, yes. there's schools, leadership programs we've supported, there's an art gallery, there's a school of architecture, there's, and the industry, members of the industry are all over the place with their generosity. Yeah. You just got to pay attention to it. And like, like if you're not in the industry, like I, I, I recognize the names personally, but I'm not sure everybody does. Yeah. So talking about making it more, I wouldn't say more transparent, but be more vocal about it. Person, mm -hmm. That's just personal feedback. Because it made me proud when I saw that. 
because it made a difference. Yes, well, that's for, a very to me, good point. Right? Um, I'll, I'll make it 11 <laughs> points next time. Phenomenal. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, Rob, really fantastic conversation. Really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, we have to do this again very, very soon. Very much. Fantastic, Rob. Thank, thank you, you so much. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation here with Rob McEwen of McEwen Mining and McEwen Copper. Really looking forward to having him back on and to talk more about copper and what is happening in Argentina. Get to give a bit more details on the timeline there of the project. But uh, in the meantime, hit that like and subscribe button, leave a comment, leave a like, and uh, we'll be back with lots more here from SME in New York. Thank you so much.